Welcome everyone to this week's edition of 30 Minute Theology. Uh, this week we are going to cover the subject of what does it mean to be saved. For most Christians, this probably is something they struggle with on maybe a daily basis. Some folks have professed Christ, but do they actually know what that means, how that looks? to understand it completely. A lot of us um, were saved when we were little kids. Did we actually make a profession of faith? So we're just going to kind of go through it. And uh, this is not to throw anyone's salvation into question, but maybe it'll help you give you some clarification, maybe give you some comfort um, in, in your walk with Christ. So the first thing we want to understand about uh, our salvation is we have to understand what our condition is as in comparison to how we see ourselves and how God sees our, <clears throat> how God sees us because there's a distinct difference on how we see us <clears throat> and how God sees us how God sees us so the scriptures basically tell us here in Romans 3:19 and this is Paul writing, what then are we better than they? He's speaking of um, unsaved folks. He's talking about folks who don't have Christ in them. So let's start again. What then are we better than they? Not at all. For we have pre previously uh, charged both Jew and Greek that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have, have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So we see here the Apostle Paul is basically saying that according to God's standard, there is no one that is good. We are sinful in our nature. We are sinful to our core. And we have to understand this as our condition. Let's look even deeper, <clears throat> Romans 3, 15 8 through 18. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and in the ways of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, he, he's talking about all of humanity. He's talking about all of, of mankind. So we know that we have to understand, and <clears throat> first we have to admit that we are not capable of earning our salvation according to God's standards. None of us are good. None of us do good according to God. Now, of course, for us, we, we think we could do good amongst men, and that may be fine, but our standard is God. Are we good before God? So, of course not. God's standard is much higher than ours. So without the acknowledgement of our sin nature, without that acknowledgement, we will continue to be in rebellion against God. So I cannot sit there and say, yes, I'm a good person according to God. I, I, I just can't say that. My nature is sinful. And, a, and when I stand before God, I will stand before him as a sinful man. Because we are not capable to reach to God, then God has to reach through us through grace. So what is grace? Now, knowing this, knowing that we can't get to God because of our sin nature, God reaches us to, through grace. What is grace? Grace, according to the author John Stott, grace is love to the undeserving. We are undeserving of God's love. He has no reason to love us the way he does, but yet he does love us. So his grace to us is him reaching out to us 
so that we may have the opportunity to know him better. Ephesians 2, 8 through 8 through 9, for by grace you have been saved through, the, through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not, not of works, least anyone should boast. Nothing I can do, no act is worthy of God. Nothing that I can say or do is worthy of God. So I cannot earn my salvation. God gives it to me freely. So what does this look like? So uh, first, there's a forgiveness of sin. God forgives us of our sin through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. And we'll get that a little deeper. But that forgiveness was even told in the Old Testament. And I, the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall be as wool. So God gives us the opportunity to come to him and so he can clean us. Here again, John Stott talks about this. God's love must be wonderful beyond comprehension. God could quite justly abandon us to our fate. He could have left us alone to reap the fruits of our wrongdoing and to perish in our sins. It is what we deserved, but he did not. We have to understand that, that because of our sin nature, God had no, no responsibility whatsoever to us. That's the thing that people say. People say, well, you know, God may be, so he's responsible for saving me. No Actually, it's not. There's a thing called free will. We have the choice that we can make to sin or not to sin. And of course, because of our nature is sinful, we are going to choose to sin. But so God could have easily have abandoned us. But according and, and John Stott brings it out here rightly, uh, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. So that's uh, grace being demonstrated to us through God. So how does God show us his grace? How does that grace manifest itself? Through salvation. Grace comes through salvation. And how does salvation come? Romans 10, 8 through 9 basically says us, tells us how salvation comes. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That you... If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice what Paul is saying here, that we believe in faith that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God, that he died for my sins and that he rose on the third day, that he sits at the right hand of God. He is not a a dead savior, he's a live savior, savior. And if I believe on that, if I truly have faith and believe, I will be saved. That is a true faith that I have that Christ is still still alive, is God, still exists today. How does John Stott say that? Because he loved us, because God loved us, he came after us in Christ. This was the plan from the beginning. This is the plan from the fall. When God sits there and says to Adam and Eve <clears throat> that talks about how her seed will crush the head of Satan, this was God's plan to bring Christ to us so that he would sacrifice himself for our sin. So let's go back. Because he loved us, he came after us in Christ. He pursued us even to the desolate anguish of the cross where he bore our sin, guilt, judgment, and death. It takes a hard, stony heart to remain unmoved by love like this. So Christ going to the cross bore every sin that we ever had. He bore the judgment that we were rightly due in front of God. He bore the death, the separation from God that we rightly deserve. And because Christ did this, he did this out of his love for us. But yet, as John Stott said, rightly says here you have to have quite a stony heart to not be moved by love by like that so how does 
God's grace. Well, first, salvation is a free gift. It is a gift that is freely given from God. And we see this from Romans 5.15. But the free gift is not like the offense. For it is by one man's offense, Adam, by the, by the first sin, many died and much more of much more the grace of God and the gift of grace that one man, Christ, abound to many. So Christ's salvation must be a free gift. It's not something we can earn. Again, this is a free gift. Christ gives himself totally and freely. He purchased it for us by the high price of his own blood. So what is there left for us to pay? Nothing. Since he claimed that it was all now finished, there is nothing for us to contribute. Here again, this goes back to works. Is there anything that I can do to earn my salvation? No, there's nothing I can do. Christ has paid it completely. If anyone says to you, hey, you have to do this to earn your salvation. Well, you have to be baptized or you have to go to the priest and do this or you have to do that. That's a false religion. That's a false gospel. Because clearly right here in Romans 5.15, Paul writes that the price has been paid. It's been paid in full and paid completely. So what happens? What happens when I'm saved? What, th there has to be some type of change. See, I can't be saved and then continue to act the way I am. The scripture teaches me that when I'm saved, I become a new man. I become something different. I become a new creation. I'm totally no longer the person that I am. Here we see this in John 3, um, 3 through 7, and Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is a uh, Pharisee. He is a, a teacher of the, of the old law in the, uh, from the Old Testament, and Jesus is having a discussion with him. And hear the words that Christ says. And Jesus answered him and said, Most surely I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See how Nicodemus doesn't understand what he's talking about. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus answered him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water, and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. What is Jesus talking about being born again? That you are a changed person, that you are a new person, that the old person is gone. So the apostle Paul helps us to explain <clears throat> what Jesus is talking about. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any is in Christ, he is a new creation. <clears throat> Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. So you as, an, as your old person, that person is gone. Your old sins, your old habits, your old ways, totally gone. You are a new person. You should not be recognizable to yourself because the old self no longer is wanting of the new self. It's two separate people. So all things have become new. You are dead in your sin. Dead. Your sins are dead to you. Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? We no longer want to sin. When we are a new creation, sin is distasteful for us. Are we going to sin? Absolutely. It's our nature. That's what we do. But when we do sin, we are convicted of that sin and we repent of that sin so that we will no longer continue to do that sin. If you continue to do the same sin over and over without repenting, you are not a saved person because that sin is distasteful to you. You have not become a new creation. You must be born again. You must die to sins. No longer has any meaning for you. 
verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We died with Christ when we baptized. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that as, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, so we are also should walk in newness of life. Our old person died when we were baptized by the Holy Spirit. That person's dead. We died. That old death is that old person's died. And now we have risen up into a newness of life, a new person. We are the new man. And this happens with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So once I've accepted Christ, once I've made a confession in my heart that I confess that Jesus is Lord of my life, then I am going to be baptized by the Holy, Holy Spirit. It is an immediate at moment of salvation, never repeated, brings us into the body of Christ. <clears throat> Where do we see this? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, we are all baptized in one body, <clears throat> whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. Now, not to get off the subject, but if anyone tells you there are different types of Christians, there's, you know, black Christians, white Christians, Asian Christians, Jewish Christians. No, there's not. We're all Christ, in Christ. And if you're in Christ, we are all one. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says that right here, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we have all been made to drink of the one and the same spirit. We also see this in John 1, 32 through 33. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained on him and I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize you with water said to me, upon him you see the spirit descending and remaining on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is immediate upon our confession uh, in our hearts, not just saying it out loud. I can say anything. It doesn't make any difference. I have to truly believe within my heart that Christ is the risen Savior, that he's the Lord of my life, for that baptism to happen for, from the Holy Spirit. So then we have what we call the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is constant and ongoing. So the Holy Spirit is always with us. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And indeed, the spirit of God dwells with you. How unique we are that God is actually in us. No other faith, no other religion teaches that God actually lives within you actually lives within us all, all times at all periods of our lives. It's when I accept Christ, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit walked with me daily. He is in there convicting me of my sins, teaching me, helping me. I have the Holy Spirit with me. No other faith has this. So let me continue on. Uh, verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is is life because of righteousness. I am given the righteousness of Christ, so my spirit is alive. My body is dead to sin, but my, my spirit is alive. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de de dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who also dwells with you. This is, of course, Speaking of the resurrection in the final days, another result of uh, salvation is salvation is instant, is instant of rebirth and an ongoing process with Christ. Um, I'm missing something right here. Anyway, um, so we're just going. So the results. Is, let me go back. So the results of salvation is one. Salvation is instant. It's an instantaneous rebirth. And an ongoing process of growth with Christ. That's what salvation is. So it's an instant rebirth and an ongoing process of, with Christ. Salvation, past, delivered from the penalty of sin. When I am saved, my old sins are gone. My old stuff is passed away. I do not dwell upon the sin that I've done in the past. 
I should not dwell on my what has ever happened to me or whatever I've done. And a lot of us folks, we dwell on things that have happened to us. That's still sinful. If we're dwelling on things in the past, we're holding on to that sin. If we're saved people, we don't need to hold on to that, our sin or anyone else's sin, because there's forgiveness. And if Christ forgives us, then we should forgive them and we should move past that. Salvation's present is we are being delivered from the power of sin now. Because the uh, Holy Spirit is in me, it convicts me of when I do sin. It keeps me from going towards sin. It keeps me from looking at sin. So in the, in the past, I'm delivered from my old sin, from the sins that people have done to me. I have forgiven them and I've let that go in my present. I'm being delivered from the power of sin now because I don't want anything to do with it. And salvation in the future is we will be delivered from the presence of sin. As I go in and I build uh, myself up, sin becomes less and less attracted to me as I work through my salvation. The end, in the end, we are redeemed by Christ and we have our new bodies free from sin. And of course, this is the rapture. So what are some other results of, sal of uh, salvation? Well, there's a thing we call justification. What is justification? Justification is the act of a saved person declared righteous. To be declared righteous, one must be made righteous. This is done by Christ's blood on the cross. There had to be a sacrifice for my sin. For me to be declared righteous, because until I am declared righteous, God sees my sin. And we see this in Romans 3, 20, 23 through 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption through that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as appropriation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sin that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be justified and the justifier of one who has faith in Christ. In simple terms, Jesus substitutes or is justifying me. He takes my place. He is the one, I, I have no justification, I have Jesus' justification. Jesus' righteousness is put upon me as a uh, sinful person. I take on the cloak of Jesus, and, he, and I am justified not because of anything I have done, but because everything that he has done. Let's look at another result of salvation. Adoption. So being placed into the family of God, now being children of God and not children of wrath, giving us the right to be in God's family. We were children of wrath. We are sinful. We are not a part of God's uh, people. Um, folks will sit there and say, everyone is God's children. No, you're either a child of God, a saved person by Jesus Christ, or you are a child of wrath, an unsaved person. There are We are all not children of God. That is a, a false dichotomy. Folks like to say that, but it is not true. The scriptures clearly state that you are either saved or you are not saved. There is no in-between. And we see this in Galatians 4, 4 through 6. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons because of Christ's act on the cross we are now children of God we are part of uh, counted amongst the children that God looks to as as his uh, as his children and because you are sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out Abba Father so the Holy Spirit dwells in us it puts us into the the family of God, we are part of that family. We are a part of, the, of his uh, children. We are no longer the children of wrath, but we are the children of God. And that is a humongous difference. The last part of uh, our results of our salvation is a thing we call sanctification. What is sanctification? 
Sanctification is being made into the into like Christ. This is a lifetime of work. It never ends. We are called to continue to grow in our faith and to work and to strive to be more like Christ. This is constant and this is multifaceted. Uh, your sanctification has to do with your learning the scriptures, your prayer time, your devotional time, you being called to work out your faith, uh, living out Christ as we should. Uh, Paul, Apostle Paul writes here in Romans 6 through 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and from your members as instruments of righteousness to, uh, to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law but you are under grace. <clears throat> Again, sanctification is also a process of learning. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker does not need to be ashamed, rightly, dividing the word of truth. <clears throat> in 2 Timothy uh, 3.14 and 15, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and be assured of knowing them that you have learned them from. And take from childhood that you know the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise to, uh, for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Sanctification is an ongoing learning process. That process is me strengthening my walk in Christ. How do I strengthen my walk in Christ? I strengthen my walk in Christ through daily prayer and through study of the Scriptures. How do I know who God is? How do I know who Christ is? How do I know what his expectations are for me? He gave me the book. He gave me the Bible for me to learn everything that I need to know about him. And for me to ignore the scriptures and say that I am walking as Christ walks is basically a lie. I'm, I'm not doing as I should be. So sanctification is a process that we're going to go on. And it's a result of our salvation because if I'm truly saved, I want to know more about God. I want to know more about Christ. I want to grow as a Christian. I want to everything that the Holy Spirit and God has for me. So get into the scriptures. So what does it mean to be saved? Well, we understand that our condition, that, uh, that our, uh, we are naturally sinful. And according to God's standards, nothing we do is good nor worthy of being uh, with him. Folks, we're separated from God because of our sins. We, uh, everyone thinks that may, we would have done something different uh, than Adam and Eve. No, we would not have. We would have made the same exact bad choice. That is our nature. We are sinful people and nothing we do is worthy of God or being with him. That we are saved by the grace of God and that there's nothing we can do to, uh, to secure our salvation. I just need to accept the gift. I cannot earn this salvation. I cannot do things to have God. I can't even the scale. The scale is already so uneven. There's no way for me to ever fix it straight. The only thing it can happen is through God's grace that he evens the scale for me through Christ. I can't do it. So if you're trying to earn your your way into uh, God's good graces, if you're trying to earn your salvation, you need to stop. It's not happening. You need to fall down on your knees and accept Christ's gift that is free and given to you. That when we accept that gift, that God's gift of salvation, we are a changed person. If you say you are in Christ, but there is no change in you, I have to question whether you're actually saved. If you're continuing to do the same things you did before your acceptance in Christ, are you really a changed person? Are you really saved? You need to ask yourself that question. Is the old person still the same person today? Was I different? How have I changed? How have I let go of things? Am I still holding on to grudges? Am I still holding on to past pain? Am I still holding on to things of favorite sins? Am I still behaving in my old way? If I'm still doing those things, have I really changed? 
I can't answer that question for you, but you need to sit down with the scriptures and really search yourself out. That when we do accept that, we were when we do accept Christ and we are uh, truly changed, we are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, and we are indwelled by that spirit. And that that spirit is with me, convicting me, teaching me, leading me. And so long as I am open to him, uh, helping me along the way. And that spirit stays with me and it dwells with me at all times. And that we are justified to God through the blood of Christ. We cannot justify ourselves. Christ sacrificed on the cross was our justification. He justifies us to God. Through his blood and we have to accept that gift in order to be saved and that we are adopted into the family of God we are now a part of God's family we're no longer a child of wrath but we are a child of God and we continue to grow in our faith in Christ through the process of sanctification folks this is what it means to be saved this is what my salvation looks like and I have to ask you that if your salvation doesn't look like this, please take some time and search the scriptures, get with the pastor, have a nice long talk. Folks, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed this. Next week, we're going to get some hard theology because we're actually going to look at the Trinity. So I hope you enjoyed this today. God bless. Have a great day.